by now. <laughs> so, Derek, okay. you'll just need to um, start, start the slide share. Okay, or resume share from the beginning. Okay. Yep, that's good. Okay. Excellent. Yes. So for, um, my name is Derek Alexander. I'm head of archaeology for the National Trust for Scotland. Um, and what I was going to do tonight was speak about our work in uh, Glencoe that we've been doing over the last uh, wee while. I've uh, called it a roof over their heads, which you'll see uh, obviously comes from the, the famous uh, Glencoe uh, massacre song, which everybody thinks is old and traditional, but in fact was written in the 1960s. Um, so a roof for their heads, dry shoes for their feet. Um, so a well-known, uh, um, infamous story about Glencoe and the archaeological work that we've been doing there. Um, so the Trust has, a, a, as you'll all be aware, has quite a wide range of archaeological sites in our care. Uh, we have two archaeologists and a host of volunteers that help us do survey and excavation and interpretation and engagement work with the properties. Um, everything from mountains to uh, battlefields to castles to designed landscapes and gardens uh, to vernacular buildings. So we have quite a range of uh, archaeological material. And I believe Daniel, my colleague Daniel Rhodes, came and spoke to you not so long ago about some of the work that we've done in the Highlands and Islands uh, over the years, which is a fair amount. Um, but tonight um, we're going to be um, looking at uh, the sort of Jacobite period and we've been looking, uh, Jacobites is something that is, uh, I suppose, become very popular over the last wee while. Um, I don't know if any of you went to the, um, the big exhibition in the National Museum uh, about Bonnie Prince Charlie and the Jacobites back in 2017, but it had a fantastic strap line, which was uh, one dynasty, two courts, three kingdoms, four kings, and five challenges. And the five challenges being 1689, uh, 1708, 1715, 1719, 1745. Um, and we are looking uh, tonight, obviously, at the first part of that, um, the uh, 1689 uh, side of things, and the first Highland War, or the first Jacobite uprising. Of course, Jacobites being supporters of James VII, James II, uh, after he flees uh, after the Glorious Revolution in 1688. Um, but, uh, you know, there's been, if you went to that exhibition, it was very much about um, uh, the royal courts, uh, very much in the, at Saint Germain and, and Paris and various other places. Um, it's full of lots of glitzy and glittery artifacts. Um, but for me as an archaeologist, obviously what I'm interested in is more than is less in the, in the fancy stuff that you get on on the tables at the, the big houses. Is but in the in more than the everyday uh, and the where where were the um, how did they live sort of thing. And it's quite handy that actually in the bottom half of the slide um, there was a as well as the exhibition at the time, there was a, a guided trail around connected sites that Historic Environment Scotland, the National Trust and various other groups had across the country that related to um, uh, Jacobite periods and you could go and visit them. And in fact, it's quite interesting that in, on this little fold out map that they had, uh, the image that they have in the background is Glencoe itself uh, and Bonnie Prince Charlie is quite neatly hiding the excavation site there that we've uh, spent time digging at Achtriechten. Um, but of course, there's other interests in uh, Jacobites have been have been risen or uh, rising because of uh, popular culture. Uh, Outlander um, has had an amazing effect on numbers, or did have until COVID, on the numbers of people turning up at places like Culloden, for example. I particularly like this slide. There's, um, uh, archaeology and the upstanding stone they're getting in the way of, of, of relationships. So that's always the way with archaeology, upstanding stone. Um, and of course, there's this uh, wonderful thing. A few years ago, you were, if you went to Stirling Castle in the palace there, you were able to uh, see a full uh, a Jacobite battle uh, reenacted in Lego and scale model. Um, which was rather nice for the for the kids, um, and you, you get prizes for guessing uh, which battle it is from this um, 
from this little vignette here. Of course, it's uh, the Battle of Killy Cranky. But in fact, the, the, over the years, the National Trust for Scotland has had quite a lot of um, uh, research work done and a lot of our properties relate to uh, the wider Jacobite period. In fact, when I started looking into it from the trust point of view, not just at Culloden, obviously, um, there's Glenn Finnan, um, I went into our library down the stairs and of course found this, found this book by Professor Bruce Lenman, who's a historian at uh, St Andrews University. Um, and he had already written a book covering the Jacobite period, the Jacobite cause, in association with the National Trust for Scotland. And in that, um, he had pulled together uh, many of the properties that had uh, a link to the Jacobite stories across the country. Um, the main ones, obviously, Culloden, Glen Shiel, uh, and Glen Finnan are all, are all well known. And I've already said, obviously, Jacobites uh, come from James II, James VII, uh, supporters from the word Jacob or Jacob um, for uh, Latin for James and um, supporters of James. Um, so the you know we have quite a, a wide number of properties that relate to it and of course we have little bits of every one of the the, the, the risings. Um, um, so we obviously we have uh, Killy Cranky, bits of Killy Cranky, we have the uh, Battle of uh, Dunkeld, bits of the village at Dunkeld, um, obviously, Glencoe is part of the, the same First Highland War at the end, really, uh, after things are settling down a bit. Um, Alloa Tower uh, belongs to uh, um, the Earls of Mar, and, is, is, uh, and uh, obviously Braemar is where the 1715 standard was raised. We have the Battle of Glen Shiel, and have done some archaeological excavation work at Glen Shiel in the last few years. And, of course, we then have... Um, the start and the end of uh, the 45, uh, the Glen Finnan, where the standard was raised by Bonnie Prince Charlie and, and Culloden, uh, at, which marks its uh, uh, bloody end. So, and we've done archaeological work at, um, at all of those places over the years, um, and it's uh, so it's been quite quite an interesting way to look at things from an archaeological point of view and from a storytelling point of view to try and pull some of that material together. But tonight, what I want to do is focus on uh, on Glencoe. Many of you will be uh, familiar with the Glen uh, itself and with the story of uh, of of the massacre. Although it's not really the massacre. I mean, as ever with archaeology, it's not just the massacre that we're looking at. We're looking at uh, settlement history. Um, as you'll all be aware, it's difficult at, from an archaeological point of view to identify single events in the archaeological record, uh, much though we like to try and hang things on them. It's quite, quite a difficult thing to do, but it's, it's a very useful, um, uh, I suppose, catch in terms of getting people's attention and interest. And obviously the, the material remains that we're looking at in Glencoe are very similar to the types of things that we get all through the Western Highlands and the Central Highlands. Um, uh, and they can be used really to categorise and, and uh, the similar sorts of settlements. But of course, the, the story is well known um, and I, I won't go into it in too, de too much detail, but um, effectively at the end, after um, the Glorious Revolution in England and uh, William and Mary come to the throne, um, there's uprisings in Ireland and in Scotland. In Scotland, we have Bonnie Prince, uh, Bonnie Prince Charlie, Bonnie Dundee, the other Bonnie, sorry, um, and uh, obviously the Battle of Killiecrankie, where he's killed, and then the, the rising sort of peters out after the Battle of Dunkeld, and then gets it thumped on the head at Cromdale um, uh, in 1690. And things start to um, settle down uh, slightly uh, in, 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 in Scotland. Um, William is very keen to uh, pacify the Highland clans um, for a number of reasons, um, one of which is that he is um, taking up uh, troops that he would rather use and turn his attention to fighting on the continent uh, against the big enemy for him, which is France. Um, so he uh, basically comes to the, tries to get into an agreement with the, the main Highland clans that are Jacobite supporters uh, that he will basically they'll call it quits if um, if they sign an oath of allegiance to him by the first of January sixteen ninety two, 
it, there's a lot of negotiations going on with money, certain amounts of money involved in different characters. Uh, 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 the the Glen, um, the Campbells of Redalbin uh, are are involved as negotiators. Um, anyway, the various um, negotiations go on, and McKeon, who is the uh, uh, the head man uh, of Glencoe of the McDonald's of Glencoe. Uh, and who had uh, and the McDonald's of Glencoe had taken part in Killy Cranky. Uh, he uh, g- leaves it quite late to swear the oath of allegiance. He goes on Hogmanay, which is one day before he's he's allowed to uh, sign up. Uh, he goes to Fort William to Colonel Hill at Fort William, uh, at the fort at Inverlochy. Uh, and he tries to sign his oath of allegiance there, but Colonel Hill says to him, sorry, I can't take your oath of allegiance. You have to give it to um, the sheriff in Inverary, uh, and it takes McKeon then five days in the middle of winter through snow and being arrested uh, halfway down on his journey. He he is five days late uh, to Inverary, only to find the fact that the sheriff is still on his uh, New Year Christmas holidays. Um, So eventually he does sign and the the sheriff, Campbell, um, accepts the signature. But um, it's it's, um, conveniently forgotten. uh, And in fact, it has already been decided, decided by the Master of Stair, uh, the Secretary of State for Scotland at that time, to William, that uh, they want to uh, set an example of the McDonald's of Glencoe uh, and uh, orders are issued. Uh, and that leads us to uh, the uh, billeting of troops throughout the Glen, and that eventually leads uh, to the massacre. Uh, and uh, the troops are billeted, uh, 120 men, uh, two companies uh, under the command of uh, Captain Robert Campbell of Glen Lyon, uh, and they're billeted throughout uh, the Glen, uh, and they're there. They arrive at the start of February, uh, and uh, they're there for two weeks, roughly, um, uh, staying with the, the McDonald's of Glencoe, uh, and uh, it's only on the evening of the 12th of February that orders come from Fort William via all the way down from the top, from the King uh, to Stair uh, to um, uh, Colonel Hill at uh, uh, Fort William uh, and then down to the uh, the subordinate officers, uh, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Hamilton uh, and uh, um, uh, Major uh, Drummond uh, and then down to uh, Captain Robert Campbell of Glen Lyon uh, himself. Uh, and they are then they then turn on their hosts uh, in the morning, uh, having uh, been seen to be arming. The, the McDonald's thought they were heading off, uh, but they, they turn on them, uh, and about thirty eight people are killed. Thirteen of those are men; the rest are women and children. But many others die in the, in the snow, uh, 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 trying to flee. And of course, th- we know that quite a lot of people do manage to escape. And of course, it's been. It's been um, commemorated, I suppose, uh, in uh, in art and literature and poetry and song, uh, various forms. Um, this is James Hamilton's nineteenth um, century painting of in Kelvin Grove Museum of the some of the McDonalds hiding in the hills there, down looking at the at the uh, the burning houses down below. This is another uh, version as well, quite a dramatic looking uh, scene here looking down on, again, burning houses uh, in the Glen. And of course it's celebrated, and it was celebrated, I think it was probably just, was it last weekend or a couple of weekends ago now? The commemor- well, not celebrated, commemorated uh, at, uh, at Invercoe, at the Glen Cove, and at the site uh, close to Carnac, where um, Keen's house probably stood. Um, so they, there's usually a parade from the church every year. So it's, it's a well-known event, an infamous event, and lots of people know about it in Scotland. Uh, and if you've not read it, um, read John Preble's uh, uh, book on the subject. It's uh, it's a fantastic and very easily readable um, uh, uh, book. Um, and it goes through, sets the scene quite nicely and goes through what probably happened uh, at the time. And it, it goes through all the way down on the left-hand side here, 
the um, the full uh, range of blame all the way from uh, King William at the top there who wants to pacify the Highlands and signs the orders that are given to him by John Dalrymple, Master of Stair, um, who's really doesn't like Highlanders because he sees them as a bunch of unruly guys and standing in the way of union, who of which he's um, uh, uh, is he's a big supporter of, uh, and then down through the military hierarchy from Colonel Hill through uh, James Hamilton and Major Duncanson. Sorry, I said Drummond earlier on, didn't I? Major Duncanson down to uh, the Campbells at the bottom, uh, the Campbells, the captains, Captain Robert Campbell of Glen Lyon and. Uh, Captain Drummond, I think, is the other one. Um, McKeon is killed. Uh, his sons managed to escape. Um, and as I say, the, 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 the probably the most shocking thing, and the reason that it's it's had uh, it's become so famous or infamous, is this murder against under trust. The fact that the uh, the Highland hospitality was uh, abused uh, and the people had been living with them the, uh, with McDonald's for over two weeks before they were set upon by their um, by their guests and um, so that's that's the reason it's, it's so well known of course there are paintings of the people involved John Ram Dalrymple Master of Steer that's a painting in um, and New Hills, the National Trust for Scotland property, and that's Robert Campbell of Glen Lyon himself, who had a bit of beef with the McDonald's of Glencoe as well, because they had um, pillaged his lands in Glen Lyon on the way back from Kelly Cranky. Um, but what do we know about what happened and where it happened? Well, people think of Glencoe and they think of the um, uh, the village of Glencoe as it is at the moment, uh, and of course. Um, that's all down at Loch Leven. Um, but in fact, there were a, a number of townships all the way through the Glen from the Loch all the way up as far east as Achtreichten. And that's the one that we'll be looking at. This is the map from Preble's book. Um, and these are probably the townships where the 122 companies of men were um, billeted through the Glen. Uh, probably the officers were down near the mouth of the Glen uh, and with the, the higher status individuals like McKeon and his sons uh, at Carnock uh, and other places. And by the time you get out to Achtreich, then it's maybe a couple of corporals and a few platoons of uh, individuals. Um, but they're given their orders and told to turn on them at uh, five in the morning, uh, and that's what they do. Uh, but they're going to be supported, and this is the whole reason for choosing uh, Glencoe as the um, to set an example is that it can be easily blocked off at either end, at the east end, if by coming over the Devil's Staircase and blocking off the way down from Ranach Moor, and at the west end by coming over the ferry at Balahulish and from Fort William uh, and blocking it off there. And the idea was that they were going to, the orders state that they were to cut off root and branch and exterminate everybody under the age of 70. Um, so Colonel Hill comes down with 400 men and goes up over the Devil's Staircase and Duncanson goes to Balahulish with another couple of hundred, uh, and that's adding to the 120 guys that are already in the Glen. And we think there's probably about 400, 500 McDonald's living in the Glen at the time. Um, at five in the morning, uh, Robert Campbell of Glen Lyon uh, starts his orders and kills McKeon, and uh, the other soldiers start the massacre. Um, Duncanson says to him that he'll be there at five in the morning, but he's late at the West End, uh, uh, doesn't make it from Balahulish um, uh, to block off the bottom end till seven. Uh, so by that time, people in the village know that things are going on and start to, uh, or the, the townships and start to uh, escape through the glens to the south uh, and out probably out the top end to the east as well. Uh, and Hamilton coming with the 400 men uh, over the Devil's Staircase are delayed by snow and they don't arrive until 11. Uh, and by that time, the vast majority of the massacring is over. Uh, and many people, thankfully, uh, have managed to escape, although probably about 10% of the population is uh, killed. So that's the that's a rough, quite overview of what happened when um, and just a, a sort of animated uh, thing of it. Of course, there are plenty of uh, 
people who have done historical studies of this, uh, and the, of course the documentary side of things uh, is um, uh, beautifully set out, and you can go to the National Library in Edinburgh and see the orders, and he, this is the, the a, a photocopy of it, at the top, you can read there, you are hereby ordered to fall upon the rebels, the Macdonalds of Glencoe, and put all to the sword under 70, and you have to special something that to the old fox and his sons do not on any account escape you so yeah you can, you can read the whole thing but it's um yeah it's pretty pretty gruesome gruesome stuff but um looking at the landscape itself i mean that's the thing lots of people have looked at the history and the story uh, but where did all this happen um, and of course, there's not really good map evidence. Um, what we've got, uh, the best map is from the mid 18th century from uh, General Roy's map uh, of, uh, of the time in the 1750s. Uh, and on it, this is Glencoe here, um, you can see the little dots, red dots of the townships uh, and uh, from I mark them out there for you. So there's, there's Invercoe at the mouth of the Glen and what I've put in here in brackets from the number of houses roughly shown on the Roy's map, uh, the, the a, percent, a, a number of individuals, if, if there was about 500 people living in the Glen, that's how many people might live in the village. So Invercoe, maybe about 100, Larrach at the front near 60, uh, Carnock 60, Inverriggan 60, Lekintiam 80, Achnacon, Field of the Dog, 70, and Achtriachton, maybe about 80. But this is, I mean, it's all, it's all hypothetical. It's difficult to, to be certain about it. Um, but from our point of view, from the National Trust point of view, um, I'm particularly interested in uh, Inverigan, Achnacon, and Achtriachton, because they all fall in with our property boundary of Glencoe and Dalness, which takes a, a huge... Uh, area of ground, in, and especially in the in the middle of the glen. Um, so we've done bits of work at Inverriggan, uh, uh, which is um, uh, just before you get to the visitor centre. If you're heading out of Glencoe Village on the right hand side, uh, if you look up just after you cross, the, uh, there's a burn that comes down the hill here. There's a road bridge, new road bridge going over it, uh, and in in the trees on the the right hand side you'll see a number of Scots pines. Uh, there are uh, nine of them around the ruin uh, and the nine were planted uh, as um, in commemoration of the nine individuals that were killed uh, at Inverriggan. And this is a, a photo of from the 19th century of Inverriggan uh, House, although it's a later building, it's a, as you can see, it's stone gable end uh, uh, fireplaces. Um, this is on the site of the township of Inverriggan, but it didn't wasn't there at the time of the massacre. Um, this is subsequently uh, has since fallen down, and there's only just a little uh, uh, foundation surviving now. And you can see we've done a done a brief survey of it. There's not much evidence uh, of a, the surrounding of the township around it, and that's largely because conifer plantations uh, have, were planted around it. Uh, and uh, that's probably removed any traces of any low uh, um, upstanding archaeology uh, in, that would have formed the remains of the township. But we've, we've done, as I say, done a little bit of a survey work. Further up the glen, at the turn of the glen, at Achnacon, um, um, just at the mouth of Glen Lake Namui, um, which takes you up to where some of the shielding sites were, uh, is... Um, the settlement there, you can see here there's maybe about uh, uh, eight buildings shown on Roy's map. Um, and uh, in this area here, this is where Achnacon is at, at the moment. Uh, there's a, it's on the left hand side of the road if you're heading south or heading east. Um, uh, but in fact, the roadway here uh, cuts through uh, what we think is the area of where the township at Achnacon would have been. Uh, and when they were thinking of putting in a new path, we did a bit of survey work and found the remains of at least three structures. In fact, this might be a kiln, I'm not sure, and another one out of just off screen here to the left, and traces of uh, rig and furrow cultivation. Um, and when we 
put a trench across this very low, you can see that this building has been cut in half by the 1930s road. Uh, and when we put a, a, a trench across it, we found areas of paving and the remains of banks and one or two bits of pottery. Um, so the remains of structures certainly there. And as you can see on the right hand side of the screen there, yeah, as ever, beautiful sunny day in Glencoe. Um, and just under the topsoil, you can see the paving and the, the remains of the walls coming through here. And that's the old the sheepfold, and that's looking up Glen Lake Namui uh, in the background there. So again, we've done survey work, tiny bit of excavation work at Ashnacon. But the main site that we've been focusing on is, if you know Glencoe um, uh, and the, uh, the Lochen in the middle, Loch Treachen, uh, in, in the centre of the, of the Glen here, uh, just beyond it, there's a set of trees, uh, and uh, uh, this is the site of Achtreichten, which is the field of the, the three streams. And on Roy's map, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight buildings are marked uh, in the mid 18th century, so 16, 60 years after the massacre. Um, but um, by the time, one of the things to point out here is this is the old, well, it's not the old road because in the 18th century, um, the military road was still in use until the uh, 1780s. Um, so this is a trackway running down through the Glen rather than the military road as such by then. But the settlement here is on the north side of that road. Uh, and then when you look at the map, the Ordnance Survey map, first edition Ordnance Survey map for the 1870s, um, you'll see there are two ruined farmsteads uh, here, unroofed, um, the road running through here, and there's nothing marked on the north side of the, at that bend of the road. There's nothing marked on this, and this is where the settlement should be. Uh, the modern road now comes through the middle between these two farmsteads, uh, the sheep farms, basically, and that's where the trees are. So if you're driving through Glencoe and you see a bunches of trees, those are marking the settlements of the, far, the sheep farms um, and the stone buildings there are the, are the 19th century sheep farms. But we decided we went out and had to look on the north side here to see if there was any remains. Uh, and we quickly found, uh, and um, uh, Jonathan Wordsworth and Jill Harn had already done a survey of this area and picked up a number of humps and bumps in this area um, and what we found was the outline of a, a, a number of buildings. This one here I've marked for you in yellow flags so you can see it. It's about 11 metres long and about six metres wide externally. Um, and then doing a full survey of it and here's, here's again is the map that that's the old road running through uh, here and I've marked the 18th century township in red and the 19th century abandoned farm below it is in black, and then the other farm is further to the, to the south again. And we found the remains of one, two, three, four, five buildings, uh, although there were eight on Roy's map, five buildings, a, a kiln, a grain drying kiln, and one, two, three, four enclosures or little kale yards, each of which have traces of uh, cultivation in them. So we did a survey of those uh, in detail, and there's the structures here, structure one, structure two, parallel to the road, structure three, uh, up and down the slope uh, and across the wind, the, the, the prevailing wind coming uh, from the west, so possibly a byre or a barn or something like that. Uh, structure four, foundation up here, and structure five at the back, and then this is where the kiln is and the enclosures with their traces of rig. So quite a nice... Uh, little uh, township and of course the reason that this um, survives and it's the best surviving township of the 18th century and possibly earlier uh, is because it's furthest up the Glen, it's away from any subsequent development. If you go down to Invercoe or to go to Glencoe Village now, there's lots of new houses, there's been forestry plantations, things have been built and constructed and have destroyed lots of the more subtle remains in the area. So higher up the glen you go, further to the east, the better the preservation. So we've got quite medium sort of preservation at Achnacon, but really quite good preservation uh, at Achtreichten. I say that, um, obviously one of the big 
things that was built through the Glen was the was the road in the night. This is the old road here in the foreground. This is from a photograph uh, from Can in Canna House Archive, and this is the new road running through here at the meeting of the waters higher up the Glen. Um, I'd like to know how much stone was pilfered from the 19th century settlements uh, when they were constructing things like this, or even in the upgrading of the old road. Because um, although I said well, better preserved, it's not. It certainly has been um, robbed uh, over the years for 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 subsequent farms. So uh, at Achtrichten, uh, we've done a, a number of uh, seasons of work. Um, we uh, went out on the thistle camp back in with volunteers back in 2018. Uh, this is May again, beautiful weather as you can see. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, one of the things that's great was, you know, is working in the middle of the Glen in Glencoe is a fantastic location to be. It's not some, you know, you see lots of folk getting out their cars, having taken a quick photograph and driving away again. Being in the Glen for a, 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 an extended period of time is is really really good. Um, so we, that's us walking along the old road here, um, and you you can maybe just see in in the foreground here in the middle ground. I don't know. If, can you guys see my cursor? Have I moving? Yes, we can. Can oh, that's good. Um, so that's the old road through running through here. That's the 1930s road in the background. Off to the top right is Loch the Lochen, and the trees here in the far left are marking the site of the sheep farm. Tree sheep farm. And what we've got here is the humps and bumps of that township. So a uh, couple of buildings down here, another building here, and actually I'm standing above the highest one platform here of structure five and another one running at right angles to it uh, down there. So we've done various um, bits of excavation uh, work. Um, over the years, we started off with little trial trenches. Um, I, I, I'm going to just go into a wee aside here because obviously I, I talk about them, uh, the massacre of Glencoe and that's the thing that it's, it's best known for. But in fact, if you read the muster rolls of Bonnie Prince Charlie's army from 1745, um, we know that there were uh, at least 10 McDonald's from a Triechten were in the Glencoe McDonald regiment that fought at Culloden and were in throughout the whole campaign of the 45. Um, and so these guys are, are individuals that are named. Uh, and in fact, we know that the, the head man, the taxman of uh, Triechten, Angus MacDonald, in fact, who would have been in his 70s at the time and probably lived in this township, was uh, killed at the Battle of Preston Pans. Uh, but we know that some of the other names of the other guys that were enlisted as well. So we know there were eight McDonald's and, and one McStalker from the township. And then what's also given is their, um, is some of their occupations. Um, so one's a drover, one's a merchant, and one and his son are the keepers of the change house. And so they, they probably ran a small inn, or I say an inn, it's just a house where you can have a probably a, a whiskey um, at the side of the road there. Um, but uh, John MacDonald, who was the taxman of Achtrichten uh, in, at the time of the massacre, um, he, um, he wasn't at the township at, on the night of the massacre. He was down visiting his brother at Achnacon. Him and his servant, uh, Kennedy, were down at uh, Achnacon, uh, and he is killed uh, down there, uh, although his brother, um, Ach MacDonald of Achnacon, gets away. On the, on the following day. Um, so um, if you're a headman of Achtrich, then obviously either getting killed at Preston Pans or uh, in the massacre of Glencoe, it's not, probably not a, not, a, not a thing that you want to continue. Um, so we started uh, with little trial trenches and some test pits and some metal detecting. And straight away, when we did our excavation work and opened our trenches, we came, a bit like Achnacon, we came straight down on, almost immediately onto the paving of uh, the interior of the house. And uh, here you can see um, what looks like um, a, a covered drain running through here. And part built in the floor is this lovely little uh, rotary quern, just 10, five, 10 centimeters underneath, underneath the turf. Um, so we quite quickly knew that there was, you know, there were structures there uh, to, to be, to be the, um, uh, unearthed. Um, one or two initial finds, um, this is a copper alloy coin, one 
I'm not sure it's too corroded to be sure, but it might be of Charles II. We're not 100% sure. Um, but we've got some nice bits of pottery. This is a piece of manganese mottled ware, which usually comes in a sort of tankard form, which fits in nicely with the, with the idea of one of these buildings being a sort of change house. Um, uh, also, they're really quite fine vessels, uh, and often they're stamped with the name of the king at the time. Um, so I'd love to find, that's the only bit that we found, one shared. I would love to find the, the bit that has the either William or James stamped on it would be quite would be quite good, but they also have a a, a, a quite a good um, chronological span from about the the sort of sixteen fifties uh, through to the sort of seventeen fifties, whereas the other stuff, the trailed slipware and other things, is tends to be slightly or has a has a wider date range. But the the one on the left there um, looks like it. It could easily belong in the in the 18th century. So we went to, we, after our first year of excavation work, and just doing bits of trial trenching. Uh, we went back and opened up in 2019 the whole of the interior uh, of uh, structure one, and again working with volunteers, uh, Thistle Camp volunteers, um, we uh, uncovered the entire plan of the structure. Uh, and as I say, a good lot of it had been uh, robbed uh, away. So we've got the, f the floor and the interior surviving in patches. There's the quern stone. You can see all the artifacts uh, shown around here as the little stars. Uh, one or two bits of upstanding wall, uh, large boulder incorporated into the sort of a, a mound of the wall there, and a couple of pieces of internal wall faces at this end and along here. Um, but nothing surviving on the outside as an outside wall face. Now, either the stones have been ripped out and built into the road beside it, which is right beside it, or taken into the 19th century sheep farm. Um, or, in fact, it's just, it was very, it was always very poorly built. And I think that's part of the reason. And I think part of the thing is it's had a stone foundation and some of the turf and material in the interior suggests that the upper portions of this may well have, have been uh, turf constructed. Uh, and when you look at the other buildings in the area, in, in, the, uh, in the township that survive, there, there's not a lot of good um, stonework surviving. So it could well be that that's, that's the case. And what we've got is certainly an entranceway going in here. Um, and there is a hint now that we've gone back and done a bit more excavation work of a, a possible partition uh, uh, dividing the um, the, the west end here from, from the east end there. Um, although the artifact distribution in the interior is mixed, um, there's one or two bits of, uh, uh, there's a lot of glass at the entranceway, the bottle glass, but also some window glass, a um, lot of iron uh, artifacts, uh, including what was uh, a big chunky bit uh, that we'll see in a minute. Uh, and most of the pottery seems to be at this um, east, eastern end. Uh, of course, they could have used part, and maybe that's why one of these look like possible drains. They may have used one end for overwintering uh, cattle and things as well, uh, as, although that's what some of the other buildings could be buyers and barns as well. So we've uh, we uncovered um, uh, quite a, a large area here, and you can maybe you can sort of make out the mound of the wall that runs all the way around here. That's that big stone that's built into the thickness of the wall. It's cut into the slope at the back here. Um, so I can't imagine that the, the, the wall was that uh, high standing as such. Uh, and this photograph here gives you a nice sort of view of the position of the site, especially in relation to the modern road and the, the 19th century farmstead and the, and the lochen here. So it just, it just sits up above the modern road. And it's actually quite well chosen as a location. These guys knew what they were doing because just behind me where I'm taking this photograph, there's a scree slope that has come down and continues to come down and actually covers the old road. And then beyond the township, there's another scree slope and it's covering, and you'll see traces of rig and furrow cultivation being covered by the scree. But where the township is, the scree comes down and it parts. And in fact, the, the, this township is sort of sitting on its own little prominent ridge, not very high, but it's enough that, you know, they knew that it was a good place that it wouldn't get 
covered by outwash from the uh, Anahiagig Ridge uh, above it. So there, yeah, there we go. View down, view down the road there, and that's the old road running through. So the 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 the, the buildings are right beside the old road. And again, another sunny day in May or wherever it was, or April, May. Um, and this time, this is uh, uh, the um, BBC News coming out and speaking to us. And of course, this I forgot his name, but he's a McDonald, isn't he? The reporter. Um, so he was very interested uh, in, in the, what, we were, what we were up to. But here you can see the, the outline, the, the foundations for the wall coming around and going underneath everybody here and the, the stone in the background there. Some of the nice artefacts that we got, this is um, uh, the remains of, I wasn't sure what it was at the time when we picked it up and put it into its bags, but uh, it got x-rayed. It's a large lump of iron about this size. Uh, I don't know whether you can make this out, but when it was x-rayed, you can just, for the faintest traces, you can see there's a key plate or a keyhole in there. This is a, an iron lock, uh, an 18th century lock, possibly for, for uh, either a chest or for a dresser um, uh, that would have sat, uh, so a wooden uh, uh, structure, a um, piece of furniture sitting in the, in the, in the, in the um, east end of the building. And what, what was quite interesting, I sent the, sent the um, x-ray off to one of the experts in the National Museum who was, knows all about locks, and he came back and he said, you know, it's still locked, um, which I quite liked. Uh, and then the artefacts, this is some of the stuff that we've already seen, some of the trailed slipware, quite a lot of that. A um, lot of wine glass, this is a piece of window glass, uh, some later material, um, and then one or two uh, little glass beads uh, here as well. And most recently, when we were out earlier this year, I don't have a photograph of it, but uh, we found our earliest bits of pottery, in fact, uh, um, uh, re sort of uh, reduced would it be reduced? Yes, it is reduced green glaze. Um, so uh, post-medieval sort of could be anything from the sort of 16th to 17th century. Um, and one of them's a very small little uh, jug, uh, quite an unusual form. So I've still to get that looked at. Um, uh, this is before we had our drone. So this is uh, the good old kite cam uh, with the kite, uh, the camera hanging below it to take the aerial photographs. Um, Difficult thing to do in Glencoe when it's blowing a gale, uh, but actually you get some nice fo photos out of it. And this shows you quite clearly um, the outline of the building itself. So inside wall face here, turning around, that's another bit of the inside wall face. And then doorway coming through here into the inside. And then the, the wall continues around and goes underneath that big stone and continues through here. So the whole building is about 11 meters long internally by about four meters wide internally. So quite a big, quite a big structure. And we have, we've been back this year to do, uh, to take out the, um, the bulks in between. Obviously we'd hoped to do a lot more field work uh, in the last couple of years, but COVID had put paid to some of that. Um, one of the things that we were, had always hoped to do uh, was to build a, a replica based on the evidence that we'd recovered. Um, just like the sort of t the turf structures at the Highland Folk Park in uh, at Newton Moor, uh, and here it's similar to the Glencoe, where well, you know foundation of rough stones and turf above. Uh, so the idea was to do it rather than build it on Achtrichten site itself in the middle of the glen, was to put it down at the visitor centre, uh, where more people could see it and it can be used as an interpretive device to the way that people lived in Glencoe in the 17th and the 18th century. Um, and could be used to tell the story of the massacre. Uh, uh, difficult to, um, for folk to stop in the middle of the glen. Uh, it's quite a busy road, um, but the best place to do it was was down at, hopefully at, at the visitor centre. And uh, so there's 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 evidence in another photograph from the Canna archive. Actually, this is um, from uh, I think from the Uists, but it's a a, a 19th century uh, photograph of a turf. Turf House surviving, surviving there with its um, uh, herringbone uh, cut turfs, peats cut. Uh, so quite a nice uh, structure. So there, there are structures known 
like that, and they're do, they're described, uh, they're photographed, and yeah, you know, we've got bits of archaeological evidence for some of them. Uh, so we got a team together, uh, including Tom Morton, who is a, an architect who specialises in earth construction and turf uh, work as well. Uh, and he drew up a plan because we had to go to planning permission. So we had to get a rough idea of what, what we were going to build. Uh, and really, we're using the size of the structure from the footprint of Act in itself. So that's the official uh, planning documents as they went in with the crook frames uh, paving on the floor uh, and uh, two doorways in this case, like mainly because you've got to provide uh, access and an exit if you've got num large numbers of, of visitors going in. Um, but that's that's not not too much of an issue, I don't think. Anyway, so that we all, it was all drawn up, and the idea was to assemble a team of specialists who would undertake the ex uh, the, the construction work. Um, it was going to be done with a, with volunteers and lots of thistle camps. We we're going to have about eight different thistle camps uh, with volunteers coming for a week at a time to take part. But of course, COVID in uh, 20, um, uh, 20 paid to that. Uh, and we were able to, we had to then push forward with just getting these guys to do the work. And they made a lovely job of it. Um, so we have everybody, you know, from uh, carpenters to thatchers to folk who are doing the, the stonework and the uh, the turf cutting and it started in about this time last year uh, with a watching brief on the foundations uh, as we cut in uh, we gathered stone locally we cut timber from uh, Antor uh, and just up the uh, in the uh, Achnacon the in, in the woodland there and um, the turf was actually we had a real trouble finding decent turf and we were looking all over the country and then lo and behold the craftspeople people decided actually see this turf where we're building this house it'll work um which is dead handy because that's the best place to go and then we got hazel and willow from the uh, the woodland just around the visitor center and um and uh, that was for the wattle uh, framework uh, and over the course of last year um we constructed uh the replica house uh, which is going to be open to the public uh, later in the spring this year. And the next few images, just to finish on, are uh, 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 a run through of um, its construction. So that's the site as it was levelled. And of course, you have to put in uh, a foundation for it so it can drain. Um, with the timber frame up and the uh, stone foundations in and the crux in place, um, then uh, rafters added, uh, and then the, the framework starts to go up. Uh, the wattle and uh, willow framework uh, for the for the interior is uh, assembled, and then once that's up, you can start to put build the turf walls. And you can see in the background here is actually just over to the to the left uh, of the structure is where the turf was cut from. Uh, and then it's you can just see the turf wall starting there, starting to rise up. Of course, you know, this is what's quite nice that these photographs is the is how the how the background changes throughout the course of the year as well. Um, and then that's the turf um, uh, walls coming about three quarters complete. And then the purlins going on for the for the for the roof, and then the roof almost finished, and then that's how it looks. Pretty much it is, and it's thatched with a heather thatch, uh, which was one again one of the other things that was quite difficult to get was to get heather that was long enough, uh, and we had to get heather that was ungrazed mostly from a. Um, uh, Cairn Gorms from Mar Lodge or close to our Mar Lodge estate um, in near Braemar. Um, so tons of that material was brought and then taken us right back to a cold February night. I uh, uh, wonder if this is what it, some of the structures in uh, 1692 on the uh, 13th of February may have may have looked like. I, I, I hope we're quite close to it, but um, We'll have to wait and see. Uh, we'll be doing more excavation over the next uh, few years, but certainly one of the things that we found is doing the excavation and the building of the, the replica 
has been worked really nicely hand in hand in terms of telling the story and and getting people interested in the history of the Glen and the, the archaeology of the Glen. Uh, we've, if you want to know more, uh, there are various uh, podcasts. So the Trust does its own series with uh, Jackie Bird. We've done a couple on Glencoe now, one just the last weeks it was out. And then if you were watching uh, Michael Portillo's Great Coastal Railway Journeys last week, and you can still get it on iPlayer, uh, we were on that. The excavation was on that last week. Um, and uh, as I say, we did the podcast with Jackie Bird and we've just done a thing with Bruce Fumi, who does a, a YouTube channel for Scotland history. It's just had a, a, he put it out last week about the time of the massacre and it's had a hundred, over a hundred thousand uh, uh, listens already. So uh, amazing. Uh, and then finally, the last thing that I wanted to do, bring your attention, 1972, uh, there's 50 years this year since the, the, the film, The Massacre of Glencoe. Uh, if you've not watched it, uh, watch it. It's, um, it's, who has it got in it? James, uh, it's the guy who used to be in the Carry On films as the head doctor. Uh, James Robertson something, double barrel. Yeah. Anyway. But that, and James Robertson Justice. That's the one, James Robertson Justice, so that's it. And you can see, I mean, the, the film in the back, it's actually filmed in, in the Glen, close to where the old visitor centre is. That's, that's looking, our, our settlement at Triefton is, so this is all, was all obviously cardboard cutout stuff that was constructed in the Glen for the, for the, uh, for the filming itself. Anyway, that's probably more than enough. Um, that's, that's, that's what we've been doing in Glencoe over the last, uh, we while I stop sharing.